Welcome to the Logistics Jamaica panel discussion, which is part of the Explore Do Business Jamaica Investment Conference. This panel is entitled A Critical Link in the Global Supply Chain. I'm David Priestman. I'm the publisher of Logistics Business Magazine, which is an international journal and digital media specializing in the global supply chain. Joining me on this discussion as we explore Jamaica's logistics industry are Gloria Henry. Now, Gloria is an award-winning leader whose contributions have been recognized by many organizations in Jamaica. Her biggest accomplishment is the restructuring and growth of the Port Authority's business process outsourcing portfolios and the growth of the Port Authority's business processing, uh, sorry, the growth of the Montego Bay Free Zone with consistent increases in ROE, ROA. She's currently a vice president of BPO and logistics at the Port Authority of Jamaica. And also Jeffrey Hall. Jeffrey is the CEO and director of the Jamaica Producers Group. He serves as chairman of the Scotia Group Jamaica Limited, Scotia Investments Jamaica Limited, Kingston Wharves, uh, the Lumber Depot Limited, and is also director of the Blue Power Group, uh, Sage Logistics Infrastructure, and vice president of the private sector organization of Jamaica. So welcome to all our viewers and participants. We have two industry experts with us today. The background, of course, is, is that Jamaica is implementing a global logistics hub initiative and special economic zones are being positioned to capture a greater market share of logistics activities and increase the long term competitiveness of Jamaica. Jamaica's strategic location, its physical and business infrastructure creates an ideal spot for easier linkages between other global hubs and Western markets. This session will underscore the business friendly logistics ecosystem in Jamaica and affirms Jamaica's future potential in global logistics. I actually had the pleasure myself a couple of years ago of visiting the beautiful island and touring uh, many of the logistics facilities, particularly at the port, uh, the airport cargo hubs and uh, the Montego Bay port as well, and uh, met with quite a few of the, the, the main um, protagonists behind this, this exciting development. Gloria, uh, coming to you first. I say you are Vice President of the Port Authority of Jamaica. Um, would you like to tell us initially a little bit about the developments of the port in recent years, um, particularly in terms of new warehousing and some of the investment infrastructure improvements you've been making? Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak about the Port Authority's investments in the port and the development of the port in Jamaica. So the Port Authority, the Port of Kingston, I would like to start, has been through an evolution since, this, since 1750. And in the last three decades, the PAJ has invested significantly in the development of the port infrastructure, modernizing of the equipment there, and made way for increased volumes, greater efficiency, and of course, upgrade to a modern transshipment facility. Um, the PAJ, of course, is a government agency. Um, it's responsible for the development and regulation of the ports of Jamaica and, of course, the shipping industry. But the Port Authority sees itself as a developer. And in this regard, the Port of Kingston has been a main focus, capitalizing, of course, on the fact that the port is situated in um, the Kingston Harbor, which is among the seventh um, world's largest natural harbors. Um, the Port Bustamante is situated in the Kingston Harbor as well and midway between North and South America and is the Caribbean's most modern transshipment port. So leveraging geographic location, leveraging experience, leveraging the, the um, facilities in Kingston, the Port Authority has been positioning Jamaica as a logistics hub. Jamaica is connected to over 120 ports globally, Central America, the USA East Coast, USA Gulf, Europe, South America, East Coast, Panama, and all routes leading off. And therefore Jamaica has the, you know, the least deviation on exiting, exiting the Panama Canal. Um, the Port Authority has over 80 hectares of land um, near the port, which is identified as uh, facilities that will be used to develop logistics. And just to talk a little bit about performance and why we feel that Jamaica's value proposition is clearly articulated and really needs no serious discussion because we, our history and our experience speaks for itself. Um, 
in 2020, Jamaica was among the top 100 global ports and it's top 10 in the region based of course on TEU's performance. And um, it is looking at uh, about 2 million uh, TEUs in 2021, having um, a throughput of 1.63 TEUs in 2020. And mark you, that is a pandemic year for, for Jamaica. Um, so leveraging the success of the port, the container port capacity, which is 3.2 million um, TEUs, we believe that we are poised to develop Jamaica's logistics hub. Um, in terms of experience, the Port Authority has been, well, for, for 30 years, was the developer and operator of the free zone regime, having started free zone development in Kingston and then moving it to Montego Bay. So the Port Authority has experience in free zone development, which is um, one of the facilities that is supporting logistics in Jamaica. I, I know, um, uh, I know Jeffrey is going to talk about the Kingston Wharves and Kingston Wharves capacity. And alongside the Port Authority, the Kingston Wharves has been developing and modernizing its facility. It has built a modern cargo facility in it um, there. I mean, spent, well, I don't want to talk about what it has spent. I'm sure Greg, Jeffrey will talk about that. But Jamaica's value proposition is clearly articulated. And the Port Authority has a history of supporting development. And um, in 2016, just to continue on the modernization trajectory and to ensure that the port was capable of uh, facilitating post Panamax vessels, the Port Authority entered into a divestment arrangement with CMA CGM for a 30 year operation of the port. And, and so Kingston Freeport Terminal is now the operators of the Port of Kingston, the, the Port Authority Kingston Container Terminal rather. And that entity has spent millions of dollars in preparing the infrastructure and upgrading the infrastructure, upgrading the equipment, creating a digital framework that can support logistics and really putting Jamaica forward as a player in the global logistics space. You say, Gloria, that the the port itself is, is trying to transition from being a transshipment hub into being a, a, a proper global logistics center. Correct. So yes, that is correct. So having successfully operated a global transshipment hub, yes, we are now leveraging our capabilities, our location, our experience, our knowledge, and of course, the, the times, the need, the moving in the direction that ports are moving globally across the world. You mentioned um, there are 80 hectares of, of land available at the port or in the vicinity of the port itself. What, what uh, proportion of that has been developed already or how, how quickly are you bringing new warehouses on stream? So the, that 80 hectares that is conveniently located close to the port, the development for that facility has already started. We have built out a 200 thousand square feet facility that is now ready for occupancy to support um, logistic services. Um, it's, it, it is quite modern. It has all of the modern amenities that, um, that a logistics facility would require to operate. And um, pretty much uh, we are, we, we've been putting that out there to the world. You mentioned, that despite the pandemic, that the um, throughput um, amount of uh, container traffic in, in the port has risen or may reach 2 million TUs this year. That's going to take you somewhere towards sort of two thirds of capacity. I mean, do, do you envisage at some point in the next, say, five, 10 years reaching full capacity? And if so, what, what's the potential to uh, expand further? So um, phase zero is what we're calling the current 200,000 square feet facility. Um, beyond phase zero, we are looking at um, developing the, the rest of the lands, um, logistics warehouse for cargo, value added services. We're looking at um, a world-class modern warehouse facility in the West Terminal lands. Uh, we're looking at redevelopment of the free zone and the free zone areas. 
creating and developing modern warehouses. Um, and of course, you would have heard about the warehouse and industrial park facilities that have been talked about. Um, again, we are, we are looking at the proximity to all the major ports, um, proximity to the free zones, because the free zones provide the facility for the 3PL and 4PL type services, outsource services. We have already opened a law enforcement facility adjoining the warehouse, which comprise units from Jamaica Customs Agency, the US Customs and Border Protection. And um, we are also building out and supporting facilities in neighboring um, Port Moore, St. Catherine. We mentioned, or you mentioned earlier Kingston Wharves. Uh, it might be an opportunity to bring Jeffrey in here. One of the many hats he somehow manages to wear um, is a directorship of uh, Kingston Wharves, which I think Ryan is saying that, that the largest 3PL uh, at the, the port there. So Kingston Wharves, and I, I thought that uh, Gloria did an excellent job of laying out the surrounding government infrastructure uh, that really supports Jamaica's push to excel as a logistics hub. So within that space, um, with the Port Authority being a, playing a central role, would be a private company, Kingston Wharves Limited, uh, which owns its own land, and it started life as a multi-purpose port. And by that, we mean that it handles a wide range of cargo types, not just containers. And we're seeing a huge opportunity in the context of Jamaica's objectives to offer a wider range of logistics services. So, so let me give you a quick sense of the context and then give you a sense of the services that you asked about. So the context is, as Gloria described, infrastructure expanding, at the level of a container port, um, at the level of a nearby airport, which has now been privatized within the last 24 months and has a, a clear expansion vision being the, the Manly Airport. Expansion at the soft infrastructure level, uh, legislation being the special economic zone legislation which has come into force within the last few years, productive input relief, which means that any raw material inputs for a manufacturing business are given uh, tax relief. Uh, uh, incentives around large scale and pioneering industries where you're bringing something new and substantial to the industry. Headquarters legislation, which brings tax benefits to uh, multinationals that bring expats into the community. Uh, the port community system, big investments in IT, uh, Gloria mentioned security, and of course, the CARICOM framework whereby you can trade duty-free within the region. So within that context, and within the wider push towards nearshoring, we've said to ourselves, what can we do? So we have a port that's owned land, 1.7 kilometers of birth space, and an 80-acre facility behind that. And we've expanded to acquire more lands. So what we're doing is offering a, an area of excellence, a center of excellence in motor vehicle or automotive transshipment. We think that's a great opportunity for us. Um, and we're doing that um, again, feeding 30 countries from Kingston Wharves. We are identifying opportunities to work with specialized users of bulk and break bulk cargo. So we've done an, uh, an arrangement to allow for grain silos on the terminal. We're looking at energy solutions. We've long participated in the construction sector uh, in Jamaica and in the Caribbean um, uh, on the break bulk space. As Gloria mentioned, we've opened one 150,000 square foot uh, logistics facility. And we now have identified a 14 acre site to do an additional facility, which will be, which will be about 200,000 uh, square feet. And that will include both a cold storage unit, as well as logistics facilities. At this moment in time, it's likely to do uh, kind of logistics for regional uh, users for retail and other services uh, in the Caribbean. What's interesting for us is because of the environment and because of our commitment to this success story, we are prepared to make investments with and long-term investments with potential users of our facility, and we have the flexibility to do so. So that's what's on our minds right now. 
Yeah, I've visited the the warehouse um, that Kingston Wharves have there at the, the port, and it's, it's 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 well run. And I think there is a temperature control area already, isn't it? So you've got quite a wide range of products, everything from sort of lubricants, automotive, as you say, quite a broad operation of broad portfolio of customers already. Right. So it's a purpose built facility, and it, it's a it's a special economic zone, and that means that users of that facility benefit from a twelve and a half percent tax rate, as well as concessions on imports and exports. Um, and it's up and running. We do have, as you mentioned, cold storage facility, which is very near the terminal on dock. And the idea is to put a new cold storage facility just off dock. Um, a big part of that is a shift in Jamaica generally to diversify the energy mix and to bring down the energy costs to allow Jamaica to participate in nearshoring in, in a wider range of activities. Um, Gloria, maybe you want to comment a little bit also um, within your role as VP of the Port Authority. It's not just all about Kingston, it, it's, it's the main port, but there's, there's also uh, a port in Montego Bay, which, which is, is a versatile port, isn't it? It's, it's cruise ships as well as um, being a, a, a cargo port, a freight port serving obviously the hotel industry there, but also bringing, bringing products uh, directly into Montego Bay. What, what else can you tell us about other port facilities around the island? You just need to unmute yourself, Gloria. So aside from, we, we talk about the Kingston Container Terminal, but there are so many other facilities that the Port Authority has. So of course the PAJ is an agency of the government. So it's, it, it has responsibility for all the, the ports. So outside of the port of Kingston, we have the world award winning uh, Ocherius cruise ship um, pair in, in, in Falmouth. Sorry, the Falmouth cruise ship pair. Oh God, I'm sorry. Falmouth cruise ship pair. We have the Ocherius cruise ship pair. We have the Montego Bay multi-purpose um, port, which accommodates cruise ship, it accommodates cargo, and it also accommodates bunkering. And um, we have facilities in Port Antonio, which is a boutique uh, cruise facility in Port Antonio. We have just renovated and modernized and built out a first class facility in Port Royal, in the historic town of Port Royal. And we're pleased to say that um, although that came on stream just at the start of the global pandemic, the onset of the pandemic in Jamaica, we have, um, we're now seeing um, a number of cruise vessels lined up to call on the um, Port Royal um, cruise ship facility. And we're very pleased for that. It's really a good boost for, you know, for the community of Port Royal, but more importantly, for visitors to see a piece of the historic town of Port Royal. And, and then we have other facilities that support port across transshipment and movement of goods across the island. We have Port Kaiser, we have Rocky Point, and we have Lucy. So, you know, the, the Port Authority facilities are quite diverse and it, it allows for, I mean, domestic transfer of goods, accommodating vessels across the island and supporting movement of goods across the island. So as the global logistics hub is rolled out, we will see um, the, these facilities have the capacity to accommodate movement of goods across the island. And as Gregory said, as Jeffrey says rather, um, the, the CARICOM value proposition fits right in to our own value proposition because we can move goods across the region seamlessly. I want to talk a little bit about some of the drivers behind the logistics hub initiative um, other than ports. So there are a variety of special economic zones that the government has identified uh, for development. So perhaps Jeffrey you may want to comment first, but um, the Caymanus special economic zone, there's a huge uh, amount of land available there for, for a mixed industrial development, including logistics. And there's also the, the very exciting plan development at Vernon Field, the, the former uh, military um, air base, um, which, which is, is potentially could be a massive. Uh, new airport or, or, or air cargo facility. You want to talk about what, what's happening with those developments and, and some of the other zones? Sure. I think it's important, David, to locate the various initiatives within the wider context of what's happening. So what's happening is that 
whether you take a, a geopolitical perspective or just the underlying economics of recent supply chain um, dislocation, um, what's happening is that we believe Jamaica can present something new to the logistics supply chain globally. We believe that wage rates are going up in the largest uh, economy in the world, the United States, for various reasons, and Jamaica presents a competitive labor force. We believe uh, that the rule of law in Jamaica is well understood. It's an English speaking environment. It, it's proximate to the US. So in that context, what we're saying to the world is we can identify pockets of land that are relatively uh, well situated uh, in relation to transportation and logistics, strategic and global assets. And by that, I mean a global uh, shipping port, container port, a well-run, well-invested multi-purpose terminal, a series of other in well-invested transportation faci facilities, including bulk, break bulk, crews, uh, airports, et cetera. So you'd mentioned two, and there can be many, many more because there's space within uh, Kingston, within other parishes or geographies surrounding Kingston. Uh, when these locations have been identified, whether they're public or private or public-private partnerships, what the government, and you've mentioned two very specific ones which are very attractive, but they're not the only ones. When they're identified, uh, they are able to benefit from a special economic zone framework. And as Gloria mentioned, other benefits, including the CARICOM relationship. So what that means is that you can pull a large post Panamax vessel into a terminal in the Caribbean, relatively close to the United States, and we're unique in that sense. There are one or two other uh, areas in the Northern Caribbean where that's possible, but throughout the wider CARICOM, that's a challenge that we have overcome. Relative to the, 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 the port, you can find uh, energy solutions that are emerging. You can find uh, break bulk and bulk cargo solutions that are emerging and you can find an airport nearby. Vernon Field uh, has a history, um, but the but the long and short is that it's a suitable site for uh, large scale uh, industrial and commercial development. Caymanus uh, is a similar story, large acreages of flatland, very well situated, both to the international logistics uh, assets that I mentioned, but also to the highway network in and around Jamaica, which is a relatively meaningful population size. What we're finding, for example, in the automotive transshipment business and automotive logistics business, which is important for us, is that users of that, of that industry want to make sure that there is some population in the center that they're gonna hub. And, and that, that population then serves as a base, but also a base for uh, transloading, transshipment, re-export, et cetera. And the Caymanus, uh, allows that opportunity uh, very well. Gloria, do you, do you want to add something to that? Uh, I'd like to say that um, Jamaica has done well in terms of you know where it positions itself globally. Um, we have continued to do well on the Do Business Index, um, even within the pandemic. As as Jeffrey says, we we still performed well. Um, I'm trying to remember what our, okay, so we actually 75 out of 190 in 2019, and um, we're, we're tracking well um, in 2020 and 2021. Um, we have a number of facilities that have been, industries rather, that have been identified as priority industries that will support our logistics hub in Jamaica. Um, and the special economic zone has had, has established a priority framework and looking at these industries that we feel will support our global logistics presence. And these are pharmaceutical, 
via technology, beauty care, the creative industries, and Jamaica's creative industries got a boost during the pandemic. Um, several persons who I believe were not working at home saw the opportunity to get involved in the creative industries. Uh, we have new digital media. We have, of course, the global services um, sector, and of course, logistics and supply chain. And um, the logistics and supply chain, of course, creates great opportunity for us. Um, there is training and development that is targeting logistics now. Jamaica has um, institutions that are dedicated to training and development. The Caribbean Maritime University is one such institution where training of logistics personnel is on the um, curriculum. Uh, and there is a collaboration between Mona School of Business and the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transportation, which is a CILT based in the UK. Um, they have established a chapter in Jamaica and an opportunity for Jamaicans to become certified. So I think that you know, Jamaica can also leverage the success of an already mature global services sector. The global services sector has a dedicated council and that council really is at the forefront of you know, being proactive and establishing curriculum that meets the needs of the future for the industry. That's something that I think that we can leverage as we train and develop persons for the global logistics hub. Um, there is a model that is currently being um, implemented and it is working quite well. It's really is a diverse and robust mechanism for training persons, for short-term certificate programs, for apprenticeship, um, for you know, just generating and creating a pipeline of talent. So as we, as we build out infrastructure, we are preparing our people for, um, for, 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 for the logistics um, sector. And we already have in place a regulatory framework and incentive framework that Jeffrey spoke about, the special economic zone. The Port Authority facilities are all designated um, special economic zone as well. So it makes it easy for persons to, um, to be up and running. Um, in our phase zero development, one of, the, um, one of the areas that we're going to build out is almost like a, a plug and play, an incubator type facility. Again, leveraging what we have done successfully in the business process industry where we have created a facility that really reduces the barriers for entry and an investor can come into the country, they can test, you know, see how it works and if it's successful, then we will design and build a purpose facility for them. Yeah, well, I visited the, the Caribbean Maritime University, which is right next to Norman Manley Airport, isn't it? It's a very impressive, well-run institution. Some some really bright, uh, sharp young cadets there and, and, and undergraduates and, and, and also mature students. Um, Jeffrey was talking also uh, a little bit about some of the, the issues. We talked about nearshoring. Um, obviously, the supply chain has had, um, internationally, has had, you know, extreme challenges the last 18 months. So we've looked at the, the problems in, in the Suez Canal and um, what's going on at the moment in, in the ports like Los Angeles, where they've got massive bottlenecks. And, and the good news is, obviously, Kingston port and, and Jamaica, you, you, you managed to stay open. You, you, you've done really, really well in terms of the amount of traffic handled. Do you think at the moment that a lot of uh, global supply chain companies and, and, and decision makers um, are re-evaluating, redesigning their supply chains, they're looking at new locations, they're looking at ways of doing things differently on a continental level, on a global level? Do you think there are, there are opportunities, particularly at the moment, because of the challenges that we've had? I do, David. I think that's, I think that's very relevant right now. I think we are observing a wide range of interests walking through our facilities and trying to understand what's on offer. What's interesting is that they care about the physical infrastructure, the draft, the capacity of the port, the efficiency of the port, but there's also a very specific interest in the soft infrastructure as well and our appetite to be competitive. And I think it's, it's interesting in this regard, you know, Gloria wears a hat as a Vice President of the Port Authority, which is a government institution. But she and I meet from time to time in a different capacity, which is that we're both members of the council 
of the private sector organization of Jamaica, which I, of which I'm a vice president. And what's interesting there is that Jamaica is now at a point in its history where we're having joined up conversations between business and government about who we want to be. And that set of conversations is also in the context of a reasonable amount of liquidity in the financial system. So there, there is money for investment in Jamaica. There's an appetite among business for investment. And so while I think that it's important to observe the dislocation in Port of Los Angeles and Long Beach and what's happening with COVID and its impact on supply chains in, in Asia and, and some of the geopolitical uh, chess moves that are resulting in people de-risking from more conventional manufacturing jurisdictions and wanting to be closer to the Caribbean or closer to their, their markets. That's all happening and that's for real. But I think people are gonna choose and people will still have the opportunity to be selective about where they put assets. And what we're getting a sense of is that they wanna know that there's a dynamism in the environment. Jamaica's last quarter GDP growth was 14.2%, which was above expectations and represents a coming back um, post COVID of a variety of sectors, including construction and, and some of the services sectors. And so we definitely would like to be at the table um, and believe that we're positioning ourselves well to participate in the discussions. Gloria, are you finding there's a lot of interest at the moment? Uh, are you, how, how busy are you in terms of sort of fielding inquiries and, and potential investments? We are fielding inquiries and we believe that the interest is current, but also we are positioning ourselves as an alternative to mitigate future risk, such as those that are, you know, that are currently being experienced in the global supply chain. I think if this pandemic has taught us anything, it is that having reliance on one or any specific geographic location for inputs can cause serious delays and disruption and a ripple disruption in, in countries and markets that we're seeing across the world now. So our modern logistics facility, of course, is an alternative. It's an opportunity for um, companies to see, you know, that we can provide manufacturing of inputs, we can cater to order fulfillment, and many other aspects to support the logistics. We have the vessels, we, we have the capacity for the vessels, we have the warehousing facilities, we have the people, we have the legislation and the policy framework, and we're ready. Absolutely. Jeffrey, um, looking at your, your, your role as, as um, CEO of, of the Jamaica Producers Group, how, how are you finding the government support in Jamaica helpful in terms of your plans and, and your strategies? So, so I'm CEO of Jamaica Producers Group. Jamaica Producers Group is the largest investor in Kingston Wharves, but that's just one of a number of businesses in which we're, we're engaged. Um, we have found the environment hospitable. And, and constructive, uh, we, we believe that there are a couple of avenues for further investment by our group in the current environment. Uh, the first is we're doing uh, food processing. We have a bakery and that bakery has benefited very directly from the productive input relief. We were actually offered the special economic zone status, but we, we declined it because we were quite comfortable with the productive input relief, which is that the manufacturing inputs are, are free of duty. Uh, the business exports the vast majority of what it produces, but it does have a local market. And so it was, it was constructive for us to not be a special economic zone, which is essentially an offshore asset, but to, to be within the local market, but we didn't feel at all prejudiced. That business definitely benefits from um, attractive logistics opportunities nearby. So, so that's happening. And then we have a number of other um, similar types of food interests, but, but I would say that we're feeling very positive. The other thing that we're observing for our own business, but in answer to your question about who's sniffing around Jamaica, there's a strong appetite for infrastructure right now. The perception is that uh, it's a long game and Jamaica will benefit from more infrastructure investment. And so we are having interesting conversations at the level of energy, at the level of 
water, uh, water facilities uh, in Jamaica, construction generally, including the warehouse. for further investment. And as I mentioned to you before, uh, we've identified what we consider to be a, a long-term growth potential in the wider automotive transportation logistics uh, industry. The, the logistics hub initiative is definitely helping you in terms of international uh, efficiency, in terms of the out of export products more quickly, more efficiently. Yes, it is. And I think what's important for us is a, is a kind of a step-by-step -step continuous improvement uh, mindset, which is across government. So I had mentioned specific pieces of legislation that have come into force during the course of our investment in Kingston Wharves. Um, so the special economic zone has come into force. They've had to work out the teething pains. We've done that collaboratively. The productive input relief uh, started out, I think, in maybe 2008, 2009, or 10, and it's emerged subsequent to that, and it's now very, very functional. Uh, the port community system, which is designed to uh, remove a number of um, bureaucratic steps within the customs process and the wider use of the facility and automate them, is coming into being. Uh, the port authority has a huge role there. Uh, we are now doing a number of back office type initiatives that make us very confident about our investment. So rather than a tradition of 100% of face-to-face uh, -face inspection of, of cargo, that's now uh, able to happen under camera um, with, with um, authorized economic operator status available to people who use our terminals. Uh, you know, I could go on and on. Be because our facility is a private, is private property, We've been able to, to do deals with potential users of the facility. Uh, in the case of, uh, of one user, a private company in Jamaica that wanted to put grain silos on the terminal, we were able to enter into a long-term a long agreement with them. Other potential users and users of the facility have been able to get a status within our facility for themselves to get the SEZ or the Special Economic Zone benefits. And that's been valuable and been motivating for us. Uh, our next big chess move, uh, there are a couple of big moves that we have in mind, big by our standards. So uh, I'm, what I'm about to describe to you is about a 50 million US dollar investment. Um, so we're doing an expansion of our berth seven, we operate nine deep water berths across 1.7 kilometers. We're gonna redo berth seven to the tune of 25 to $30 million. We feel good about that investment. Um, we've just bought an additional mobile harbor crane the largest in the Caribbean. We just bought one maybe three years ago. We're, we're about to do, we, we've definitely committed ourselves to an immediate investment of 50,000 square feet of purpose-built, well-invested coal storage. And that's gonna come on, that's gonna break ground this year. And then we're adding to that um, uh, an ambient storage facility build out that already has um, kind of soft circled uh, international uh, users for the facility. So I would say there's a, in the context of the soft infrastructure, we're willing to put our investment dollar behind the harder infrastructure. We haven't talked at all about air freight, so maybe we should quickly move on to that. I mean, obviously we've got Norman Manley International Airport at Kingston. You've, you've got the Sangster Airport at Montego Bay, and there's some smaller airports as well that have some courier traffic and things. And, um, and, and, and I know the Airports Authority have partners there. I guess we, with the lack of passenger jets, obviously since, since the pandemic, you know, the, the, a lot of the belly capacity there for cargo hasn't been there, but I mean, how medium term, it, that, that's a key part of the, the initiative, isn't it? To, to be able to offer much greater air cargo uh, capacity, uh, global capacity really to, to, to help with, with expansion. Yes, so, um... So Jamaica, uh, quote unquote, privatized Norman Manley Airport uh, two years ago to a multinational airport operator um, with a commitment on the part of that airport operator to extend the runway to allow for uh, larger uh, aircraft 
and higher safety standards as well, and also to allow for overall investment in the facility. And Montego Bay, which is an even larger airport, is also undergoing quite a substantial capital investment program, again, within the context of a private airport operator. Uh, we believe that uh, the e-commerce trend is not stopping and that that presents an opportunity to serve the Caribbean um, with, with air cargo to some extent. And we also believe that the nexus between the airport and both the uh, cargo ports and the cruise port, um, and, and Gloria is the expert on these things, so I shouldn't be speaking, um, is another huge opportunity for, for Jamaica. And we also believe that the nexus between the cargo ports and the cruise ports and the airports um, in the context of home porting presents a big opportunity for, for all concerned. And so we're prepared to invest behind all of those things. Uh, obviously, the Vernon Field development as well, with the huge runways there, gives you the capacity for the largest freighters, doesn't it? Which I mean, opens then routes to Asia and, and globally, I guess. Well, what, one of the issues with the Caribbean is that is that there's a sense that because of scale, you have to admit these are not the largest countries on earth. So, because of scale, there's a sense that you do one round of, of investment, and you can't then do pretty substantial follow-on investments, um, which are necessary because once you become a hub and you have the kind of network effect, you need to keep going. And so Vernon Field, I think, says to the world, you know, if we do all the things that are in our short-term immediate menu, we have you know, significant expansion capacity. But I do feel, David, that I'm stepping into Gloria's territory where she's uh, talking about yeah. so. Yeah, it's been Gloria back in to get the comment on, on these areas and, 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 and some other things that, that you want to, uh, to move on to before we wrap up. Well, uh, Jeffrey has articulated quite well the capacity of you know, air transport in Jamaica with the privatization and modernizing of the two airports, the two main, main airports. Um, Montego Bay uh, currently serves our home port in facility in, in Montego Bay. We have own porting at the cruise terminal, the cruise ship here in Montego Bay. And um, it, it really supports a wider uh, business, um, a, a wider uh, business case, I would say, um, incorporating not just um, the hotels, the airport, the seaport, but also transportation providers, um, goods and services providers, and you know the opportunity for again for logistics to support that ecosystem. Um, I did not mention, and I should mention, the presence of liquid natural gas (LNG) that is now provided from the port of Montego Bay and supports the, the, the island. Um, and, and that also creates great opportunities. I mean, we've already mentioned that we have a stable macroeconomic environment, but that facility also provides opportunities in logistics in, from a cost perspective. Um, so I just wanted to mention that, that outside of you know, all the things that, all the drivers that we have mentioned before, that that also is an opportunity. And there is opportunity for home porting in Kingston as well, as that airport facility is built out. Um, for for the development of you know tourist tourist industry the tourism industry in that area and and hotels in that area, um, I I don't have much to say on Burnham Field I I I, I would prefer not to get, get into that because I don't know enough about that as yet and I'm not sure where we stand from a company perspective on that facility. Uh, I think that's something that the Ministry of Transport would speak about. So I don't really want to get into that discussion at this time. Thank you. And, and Jeffrey, anything that we, we haven't touched upon with, with some of your other roles uh, and businesses? Well, uh, from a, from, I have some exposure to the financial services sector and I have some exposure to the construction sector as well as other consumer goods. I would say that wearing the financial services sector hat. Um, Jamaica has a fairly developed capital market. And by that, I mean 
um, you can you can have a good concept, um, provided the principals are are serious people, um, and have and the idea is bankable or investable, and raise money domestically. Um, equity, there's a, a, a stock market that's vibrant and 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 well governed. There is a bond market um, that's that's very functional, and they can accommodate even at the level of fairly significant infrastructure investments. Um, and that's happening. Um, in, the, in the construction sector, I would say that because relative to our history, interest rates are, are low, there's a, a bit of a construction boom. So throughout the COVID pandemic, that's global by the way, to some extent, but, but I think it's also likely to be sustained in, in, in Jamaica. The growth rates have been, I think, on the order of 7%. And there, there's quite a bit of opportunity left based on what's happening in the capital markets, um, as well as housing demand, low-income housing in particular, uh, but also infrastructure. And from a consumer goods standpoint, I think some of the points that Gloria mentioned about the growth in the services sector, um, the business process outsourcing sector um, and other related services sector, including tourism and logistics. There's an emerging uh, class of, of young upwardly mobile uh, consumers with steady employment. And uh, that's very interesting as well and presents opportunities. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll wrap up here and, and um, thank uh, Jeffrey Hall and, and Gloria Henry for their time. Uh, we, Plenty of other things we could have touched upon, but I hope we've given a good flavour of the opportunity and the, the investments uh, potential uh, for Jamaica with their exciting logistics initiative. Thank you for joining us and please enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thanks, Gloria.